In this example, we're going to utilize the squeeze theorem to find this limit. Now, first of all, I should um, explain to you why I know that the squeeze theorem is the right sort of tool to use for this uh, particular limit. See, if we were to go ahead and plug in and see what happens, which is our usual mode of finding limits, uh, we would get a, a zero times sine of 1 over 0 squared, which would just be 1 over 0. And basically, we have no way to handle this. Okay. In some sense, 1 over 0 is kind of like infinity because you would think about the smaller the denominator gets, the larger the actual fraction is. Perhaps it would be either plus infinity or minus infinity, but either way would be we would be looking at basically end behavior of the sine function. But the sine function oscillates, and so it doesn't really have a set end behavior. And so we have no way to handle that um, sine of 1 over 0 um, situation there. So what we do is we utilize the squeeze theorem to be able to compute this limit. Uh, and what we need here is kind of a starting place. And so we start by bounding what you know by by bounding what we know. So we know that the sine function, as well as the cosine function for that matter, really it doesn't matter which one we have in a given problem, uh, we know that the sine function is bounded between uh, negative 1 and 1. So regardless of what we plug in, uh, we have the sine function, so that sine of 1 over x squared part, is going to be uh, bounded between negative 1 and 1. Now, so far there in the middle, we don't have completely uh, the entire function we want the limit of. Uh, we've got that extra x factor that's in the front. But the thing about this is, is now we're dealing with inequalities. And inequalities, whenever we do something to one piece of the inequality, we have to do it to all pieces of the inequality. And we have to pay attention to the sign, like as in positive or negative, um, to know whether or not we need to flip the, um, the inequalities. So our problem here is x could be negative. Um, we don't know. It's our variable. And so we can't just throw in the x everywhere on this inequality. So we're going to have to work a little bit harder for this particular one. So uh, we're going to do something like what I call fold the inequality. So the exact same compound inequality that we had before is that statement is saying the exact same thing as if we were to take that middle part, uh, sine of 1 over x squared, stick it in the absolute values, and kind of fold over that negative 1 to the other side with the 1, since those match on the left and right hand side there. So actually the compound inequality that we started with, as well as this folded inequality, those are identical. Those two, um, that absolute value inequality is saying the exact same thing. So now I did this folding so that now I can multiply both sides of the inequality by something that is positive. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the positive. And positive is really key here because we're dealing with inequalities. Um, absolute value of x. Okay, so x could be negative, but the absolute value of x is definitely positive. And so what we do there is we've got the absolute value of x times the absolute value of sine of 1 over x squared, and then that's going to be less than or equal to the 1 times the absolute value of x, which would just be absolute value of x. So now here on the left-hand side, multiplying two absolute values would just be the absolute value of the product. So we're looking at x times sine of 1 over x squared in the absolute value less than or equal to absolute value of x. Okay? So we're getting closer because now we do have, it's in absolute values now, but we do have the entire function we are trying to take the limit of. And so here's, how, here's what we do next. We fold it in inequality, so now we're ready to unfold it. So unfold uh, the inequality. So unfolding the inequality, we take that part on the left-hand side that's in absolute values, it becomes the middle where we can now drop the absolute values. But um, 
we keep the absolute value of x on the right side and we unfold it to negative the absolute value of x on the left hand side. So now just keep perspective here. What have we done? Well, we've got that uh, function that we started with in the middle, and look what the lower and the upper functions are. It's really just plus and minus the absolute value of that factor that's in front of the trig part that we started out by bounding. And that really is what happens on all of these sorts of problems, and I think with some practice you can uh, make that connection also. So now what we have is a lower function here. This is going to be our L of X and an upper function here, which is going to be our u of x. So we have met now the first hypothesis of the, um, of the squeeze theorem. So it remains to show what the limit of each one of those is and note that they match. So let's look here, the limit as x goes to zero, we're choosing x going to zero because that's the original uh, limit statement that we had, the limit as x goes to zero of this function. Now we still need to look at the limit as x goes to zero of the lower and upper. So um, for the lower function, it would be the limit as x goes to zero of negative the absolute value of x. Well, negative the absolute value of zero would just be negative zero. It's simply zero. And the same sort of thing's gonna happen there for the upper function. Limit as x goes to zero, because that was in the original statement limit that we're looking for, of the upper function is going to be um, the limit of the absolute value of x. As x goes to zero, we can get that by plugging in zero. Absolute value of zero is zero. Now it's not good enough just to compute those two things. You do have to acknowledge that they match. Since they match and one was below and one was above the function we care about, by the squeeze theorem, we can get our final answer. So by the squeeze theorem, we've got that the limit of that middle function as, it, as x goes to the same thing, so that middle function is the x times sine of one over x squared, that's going to be the matching value. Um, so that matching value was zero, so that's going to be uh, zero as well. And that is really the answer that we're looking for, but you see all of the work that we had to do to be able to utilize the squeeze theorem. We first had to justify that we do have a lower and an upper function that, uh, do, that, does, that each one does the trick, and that those two um, functions go to the same value before we can employ the squeeze theorem to get our final answer.